I guess that's the first design principles, take some risks, but uh, yeah, so yeah, Mike Needham, I'm a solution architect with uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, and I am also look after some of our emerging markets uh, in that space. So, um, but I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Alexa here, and uh, so um, uh, Alexa, Alexa, introduce yourself. I'm an Amazon Echo. You can choose to call me either Alexa, Amazon, or Echo in the Alexa app. Boom. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so we welcome Alexa, but uh, you, you don't want to offend Alexa, so, um, because uh, Alexa is capable of dishing out uh, a world of pain. Um, so anybody who violates the, uh, the, the troll policy, um, Alexa, play Justin Bieber on Spotify. <laughs> Playing Justin Bieber from Spotify. Okay. So endless hours of this will be given to anyone who, uh, who oh, trolls Alexa. Alexa, cancel. Alexa, <laughs> cancel. Someone's been trolling. There we go. Oh, Alexa, <laughs> cancel. There we go. Got to be assertive. Good. Good. So, um, good. So, my, my choice of, uh, I, I we'll be involving Alexa later. So, um, my choice of uh, talk really is that I've spent um, a good 10 years um, uh, working in uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, with an Aspis group. Um, I was involved in over 50 of their MA deals uh, in terms of technical due diligence. So, I got the, the real honor and opportunity of seeing under the hood of some of the great startups of our time. Uh, startups like Flipkart in India, you know, who turned a billion dollars in revenue uh, in 2014 uh, and continue to, to rocket. So, uh, and also just by working in AWS, I've, I've had the, the luxury of working with so many successful and amazing companies. So, um, so obviously you can't share, you know, private information on that, but I, I, I just over the years have, have humbly extracted five or so design principles, um, you know, what I believe are, are really core tenants of these very successful companies. Um, and and it's, a living, it's a living set of principles, so, you know, it's, it's relevant for IT as it is now. So, start on a nice negative note, um, you know, one in ten startups uh, uh, succeed, or, you know, is it, is it one, in, one in a thousand? Um, I, I don't know who holds the registry for startup failures, uh, but, uh, but actually, I think there's a far, this is overshadowed by a greater trend and an increasing trend in, in my opinion, which is that increasingly companies are failing uh, and, and it's less of the focus on startup. Uh, you know, companies are failing to embrace a transformation. They're not bringing the right cultures into their teams. Uh, they're not embracing uh, lean methods. Uh, you know, we had, a, we had a startup track uh, last week. We interviewed Stefan Ekberg from Travel Start at our AWS startup conference. You know, and his argument is enterprises are not actually at all capable of cultivating some of these cultures and spin-outs are required. So, um, so this led Richard Foster, I think back in 2013, to predict that you know, 75% of the companies that are in the top, this top indice, the S&P 500, you know, our, our names are gonna be never heard of. And uh, so really we, we're, we're in this era of disruption, right? Um, Harvard Business Review, 85% of new products fail. So, so, not sounding good news, but on the other hand, this massive opportunity, right? Um, and I think we're seeing it every single day. Um, so arguably, I mean, there's the old adage, don't reinvent the wheel, right? But I think when it comes, and of course in technology that makes sense, but when it comes to product, uh, maybe we should be reinventing the wheel. And, uh, you know, no, no bastion of strength of existing large companies that have ownership over large markets and products are really safe. And I think that's being fueled fundamentally by uh, cloud, right? Run your stuff on other people's computers, but run it globally uh, without you having to have gone out and deployed it all around the world. So uh, that, that's just one of the things that's fueling this new era. So if you've been to any AWS conference, you will have seen the slide um, you know, Airbnb, uh, a, a classic disruptor, right? The largest hotel chain in the world uh, that doesn't own a hotel. You know, Uber, largest taxi company that doesn't own a taxi. Um, 
and uh, you know, locally SnapScan, right? Completely disrupted the merchant terminal. So, um, so really, uh, you know, this is this is the era, and this is what is this is what is uh, transpiring. So, so uh, you know, I would, I would urge you, and as I, before I go into the the five design principles, just to to consider what is your next wheel. And uh, you know, for me, this this would be it. Uh, that is a GIF from Reddit, and it's not playing on Keynote. So uh, uh, anyway. That icy thing is a is basically um, uh, a, is a quantum locked, <laughs> super cooled uh, piece of material that is floating around in the air. It's basically a hoverboard, and uh, this is Meisner effect was discovered in, in 1911. So my question out there is why has someone not made this into a hoverboard? It kind of just like goes around, and you can change its shape and it'll maintain its state as it goes around. So. Anyway, hopefully my other videos will be playing as well. So, so I think just as a prologue to this is, you know, n never before have your, uh, has there been a, a better chance from a timing perspective uh, to, to disrupt. Um, so that if you look at the, the multitude of factors that define product success, timing is definitely one of the most important. And there's product-specific timing and domain-specific timing, and that's, that's down to you as a founder. But... Assuming the macroeconomic timing is, is, is correct in our times, then the next most important thing is your team and your execution, right? Because without a good team, without that execution, it doesn't matter how good your idea is, it doesn't matter how, good, how much funding you have and how, much, uh, uh, and how well your business model is constructed. So, so this is where I'm going to be focusing today and particularly on execution. So, so really the, uh, the foundation of execution is planning. So... Uh, Ah, <laughs> no audio, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure, it's not possible to link up audio to this, sorry. Okay, sorry guys, uh, I'll, I'll run you through it. But the principle of this video is really that, uh, you know, this guy's just saying that he's, he's willing to execute in his plans, but the reality is, is he just hasn't gone and really thought it out and put it down there, right? So, and I mean, as startups, you know, the last thing you really need to be worrying about is, is uh, uh, I mean, you guys understand this principle, right? You need to have your pitches in place. So what's always in a great pitch is lots and lots of product and the famous hockey curve, right? But what's often missing is uh, how are you going to execute? You're going to have this amazing traction in your product, but what are your unit economics as that scale? Will you really be able to afford as you break through the various scale barriers? Um, and you see this challenge being addressed all the time in all of our previous speakers on how they're optimizing and so on. So really, it's just all about that execution. And of course, that comes with an outcome. You have your investor pitch, you have your customer pitch. But one point I want to make uh, uh, is, and I, I, I was told this at another conference, and I was really impressed by it, is, is where is your employee pitch? And I'd be interested to know, as all of you in companies, you know, does your company have a really, really awesome employee pitch? You know, one that really tells you what the culture is going to be like working there. You go to so many websites, you click on the jobs link, and there's just PHP developer, UX developer, right? Uh, there is uh, about us, and it's a photo of the team, and that's where it ends. Uh, where is your employee pitch? So, you know, uh, look, we all love GitHub. GitHub are brilliant. Uh, they start with the office, right? The office is one part of your employee pitch. Um, this is actually an accelerator in Norway. Uh, where they've made the throne room into a forest, and uh, so creative creativity at all times. Uh, so <laughs> and then locally, um, you know, Yuppie Chef, uh, they are just brilliant at, at imparting their philosophies on their YouTube channels. They have an annual blog, you know, they are like got a staff video on who they are and what they're doing. So where's your employee pitch, you know? And one doesn't get the feeling that people work here at Yuppie Chef, they are Yuppie Chef. So, uh, you know, inspiring local example. And these guys, uh, payroll, uh, some Filipino founders, uh, they loved, uh, they moved over to the US, they loved work, they loved skiing. So they basically uh, formed their, their offices are actually in a Colorado ski, ski resort. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's it. And their whole theme and their culture is adventure and living in the wild and in the stretch. So, uh, you know, so, so there's, there's that inspiration from that perspective. So this is my mid mid deck uh, wake you up slide. So let, let's get on to the let's get on to the, the 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 design patterns from the technical perspective and execution. 
So the first design pattern that I've seen in these very successful companies is, um, is first of all, their association with the ecosystems of innovation. Now, I mean, there's the obvious ones, right? Open source, this conference, uh, your meetups that you're going to, and so on. Um, but the, the key is that when you're launching a product, to what extent are you backing platforms and ecosystems that are appropriate for the unique selling point of your product? You know, as technologists, we tend to fall into what we've always done. I work with these frameworks, I work with these cloud providers, uh, I deliver um, in this way. But if you've perhaps, uh, you're perhaps going to start a, a blockchain as a service um, based product, who's got a blockchain as a service service that you can leverage? Uh, am I going to the meetups where I'm going to find out the most about that technology? So I think, you know, does, Principle number one is, is ensure that you are associating yourself with the correct ecosystems. AWS, uh, sorry, the keynote is, uh, I missed it slightly. AWS um, released, I think, about 700 features last year uh, in terms of its stack. That's awesome. Have a look at those features. Are they the features that are, are really going to add that value to your, to your next killer product? Um, and, and, and consider all the options out there. So. Um, just a few of our new products. Uh, I'm not here to sell products, but I'm just making you aware that you know this is the kind of things that we're doing right now, right? We're releasing. Uh, we've just released our Internet of Things uh, uh, platform. I think most recently we've released uh, Lumberyard, which is a gaming platform. So again, you need to be looking at like, are we the right people? Are we the fastest horse running in the race to host your product, or is it another platform? Uh, and, and and make your choices. Right. So my next design principle um, is uh, is that you sh is the learn and adapt. And uh, you know, I'm certainly I'm sure you've had it uh, you know to hear in terms of agile methods and the understanding of all of the benefits of that, right? Um, but I, if I ran my own uh, startup, I'd probably print this out and put it on a wall somewhere, right? Um, and, and we look at this and we say, yeah, I'm I'm happy like you know to be MVP and so on, but. From all of my experience of looking at companies, there's very few that have actually gone out there embarrassed. Uh, you know, you're presenting up here on your product and everyone's laughing. You know, are you willing to go through that? Because um, I, I think the, the challenge of, of how MVP you've really gone, um, I think uh, is not always question enough uh, in, your, in your early stage of your product. So, uh, you know, AWS, this is a, an example of of, of Prime Air going through its, uh, through its stages. I'd also print this out and put it on the, on the wall. Uh, I think it's just awesome. <laughs> you know, the broken piece of wood and like a killer red button, uh, you know, that is, that's full MVP. I mean, you're gonna get serious RSI from this thing, but it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. It, it defines, uh, you know, that MVP model. Um, if you wanna be even crueler to your developers, you'd print this out and put it on your wall, which is the Times New Roman cut of of, uh, of Amazon um, back in 1995 uh, with our awesome bluey gray theme. <laughs> so, yeah. But, so fine, we, you, you need to learn and adapt uh, and we speak a lot about being uh, adaptive and pivoting and so on with our products, but how often are we focusing on our products themselves adapting themselves, right? Machine learning. What is your machine learning strategy for your product? And, um, and I think this is, uh, I, I have really, see, the really successful companies are making massive use of machine learning. Even Alexi here, the, the quality of her voice is, um, is completely defined by machine learning. You know, multiple phonemes, thousands of them being selected, breaking down exactly how words could sound and through machine learning, learning to speak in the most human-like form uh, possible. Um, so, so machine learning is, uh, when leveraged, has massive power to differentiate you further uh, in your products. So, oh, sorry, this was keynote, uh, uh, keynote uh, problems. So, um, wow, boom. <laughs> That's a stuff slide. Um, but anyway, the, the most important pieces here, and I think all I'm trying to say is, is through, the, through, the, through the years, 
you know, there's been the eras of machine learning, neuro and kernel systems and whatever that says, and then, uh, <laughs> and then services. So, um, so, you know, but, but that's the key. It's machine learning now. In the past, it was a very complex uh, platform that you put in place. Uh, you need to have a huge amount of sort of uh, intellectual property in the space. But more and more providers are opening up, you know, machine learning as a service, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and people are leveraging in the ecosystem. So, and I mean, there's the obvious candidates you know about, right, on Amazon recommendations and so on, but, you know, the not-so-obvious ones, like plagiarism detection in self-published books, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, customer problem detection, forecasting customer problems, right? Um, and then, um, uh, you know, so substitution predictions. What do we think customers will substitute their products with in, in, in Amazon if they can't find the particular ones that they're, they're using? So, so, you know, some, some less obvious things there, and I think that I really, uh, I think the winning companies out there are making massive use of machine learning to, to get that extra edge and, the, and, the, and that analytics in. So um, AWS has relatively recently released their machine learning service, um, and it has its space that it plays in, right? So um, it's distributed, and, and, and this is, you know, a big plus. Um, it's also built for failure in terms of the model and the, and the availability of data. It simplifies onboarding. How it simplifies machine learning for people to use as engineering is it's, it's got zero parameter algorithms. So really advanced people using machine learning will want to be tweaking their algorithms with baseline parameters. Um, but we've made sort of 80-20 assumptions on behalf of the developers. And also the challenge of people wanting to run machine learning where that you can converge to a result uh, within constraints of price and time, right? I want to run this. I want it either to be a real-time predictive analytics or I want this to run for, and I don't want to spend more than this amount. And that has a certain challenge. So we're solving these challenges for you in terms of the machine learning. Of course, there's nothing stopping you taking Spark ML and using that on top of EMR and so on, uh, Elastic MapReduce framework. Um, that, you know, go and use the more advanced algorithms available through, through that. You know, we support regression and uh, multi-classification and so on. So really then, so that's, so you, you, you're leveraging the right ecosystems of innovation. Um, you're, you're learning and adapting, not just in who you are as decision makers and in your process and being agile, but your products are learning and adapting. Um, and then of course it's being ready to scale, you know, and it, again, it's obvious, right? But how many companies we've seen, I mean, how many companies to this day still go down on Black Friday, like with retailers, even locally? So um, it's, 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 not, it's not often, a le the, the best companies are truly taking this on board. So, you know, an example is Animoto, who, who had to scale from, you know, 40 instances to 5,000 in three days, you know? So, so the, these are non-trivial challenges, and not always a challenge we face in South Africa because of the volumes and, and what we have, but there's a lot of companies increasingly based here going global and, uh, and having to face this. So, so, you know, and compute generally, I mean, in the AWS space specifically, we've just, uh, I think we're launching within this year the X1, which is gonna be 100 cores and two terabytes on a single node. Um, so scale up is, is, you know, there's a lot of scale up. Um, and then you, you'd, you'd be well aware of this if you're using AWS, there's always the scale out option with our auto scaling technology, right? And the aim is to get to the right hand side, which is that you want to be as closely mapping to your, to your load as possible. And again, it's, it's really obvious stuff, but are you truly executing on that? Are you breaking your system into services? Are you getting a lot of signups? Is your whole stack scaling? Or, have you, or is just your signup server scaling and the rest of the stacks idling? So, um, you know, making that, making that choice. So, um, you know, so AWS, I, I think where it's, it, it, it's cut its uh, teeth has, has had the luxury of having these brands and these kind of businesses uh, in the unicorn club, you know, 80% penetration of, of people having, using some kind of AWS tech. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it certainly knows something about scale. So then um, the fourth principle that I want to touch on is, uh, or, or pattern, is introducing cost at unit scale, and this is a bit more on the technological side. So um, the, the ideal with any product is that, you know, basically the, the, you want to be able to match 
If there is one person on your site, it costs you the price of one person. If there's 100,000 people coming in, it costs you 100,000. You don't want to be paying for an overhead of a stack that, um, you know, that, that has fat in it, that has overhead, right? So if you look at where um, cloud computing generally, and again, map this to your own favorite cloud provider if need be, but w w what's happening is, is we, we've, we've, we've had the era of multi-gig, multi-core, uh, servers available to you, and you've got these in auto scaling groups, and you're growing them incrementally by the size of the server, right? Now, being a little bit more monolithic, often in, in stack, people often have quite chunky servers, so the increment blocks are very, very rough, right? So then we've, um, we now have, uh, just recently we, were, we launched the T2 Nano, single core server, so arguably, if you can fit your stack in your layer down into scaling across a single core, then you now, with auto scaling, your increments are by CPU, right? Uh, even more granular, we've introduced Docker uh, into the ecosystem. So now, I mean, ultimately, a container is a process, right, on a, on a substrate. So now you're at sort of, you've gone from, you know, multi-CPU, single CPU process um, in, a, in the persistent space, you've got services like Dynamo, which are transactions per second in and out, right? Um, almost free storage, uh, but just, just priced on that. And then kind of moving into the outer extreme is uh, our Lambda service. And Lambda is effectively a, a service where you upload source code into the cloud, and we execute your function in a container on your behalf. Um, so almost like a you know, cloud bus, as it were. Um, and we're charging you in 100 milliseconds of execution of that function, your Node.js function, your Python function, your Java function. So you can see the trend of where it's going. And what, what, what's happening here is we're enabling the architectures uh, of, of very, very granular uh, mapping to your, to your uh, workloads. So this is like the, the newer era for us is serverless AWS. So our, our offering in the serverless paradigm, uh, in other words, uh, the space where you're not actually having to worry about servers. You're not on Linux and Windows, you know, managing your server stack. Um, you're simply deploying code into the cloud. It's our combination of our API gateway, uh, which again is paper use, and Lambda executing functions. So let's just take a small example, and this is actually a live example. You can surf in there. Please don't. You'll kill my bandwidth for Alexa. Um, but uh, basically, so you could have an S3 bucket hosting an Angular, React, uh, Angular JS application sent out of S3 over HTTP. So S3, paper use on storage, right? Uh, data out, paper use, right? Now you at your client, the, the actual app is executing, it's making callbacks to the server, REST callbacks through our API gateway, paper use, right? Uh, you're hitting these various REST commands. Uh, here, here are the Lambda functions that will execute, like deleting of an acorn in this case, squirrel bin. Uh, I, I, I guess the DNA of a Dropbox clone here or a snippet clone or whatever it is. Um, and then basically storing it in, in Dynamo, right? Transactions per second. So not a single EC2 compute server that you are worrying about at play. And um, effectively, if, you have, if no one is on the stack, it goes close to zero costing. When a lot of people on the stack, you're paying on a transactional level. So this is, this is our, our kind of... Um, uh, what, what we're trying to support you in in this kind of new era of serverless compute. But it has its challenges, right? And sorry, this GIF won't play. So um, it has its challenges uh, in the sense that we offer you an API to create functions, lead functions. That's quickly going to get out of hand in a very complex stack, right? So I'd encourage you to take a look at this framework. It's called serverless. Uh, it used to be called JAWS. And um, they've really... Uh, it, it, got a huge amount of traction on GitHub, like within two months, you know, 4, 000, actually 4,700 likes, not 4,400. Um, and in effect, it's, um, it's leveraging the ecosystem of Lambda, where, uh, yes, it's containers, but you're not worrying about those containers in the background. Um, it, it's allowing you, it auto scales for you, it can, you can connect it to the API gateway. So um, if, if, we, if we take a breakdown of what the serverless framework is doing, um, it's in effect introducing the concepts to Lambda, which is a very DNA type service, um, of stages like dev, test, production in multiple regions around the world. Remember that, this, that the functionality of Lambda is stateless. 
Uh, so if you're, and, and, and how you're going to have state is probably in a Dynamo or a Redis or, or you know, a relational database in the back, whatever it is. Um, and then it's also managing the associated resources, the policy, the security, et cetera. Um, and uh, there's your deployment uh, of your APIs and your deployment of your functionality to use that. And they're smart about it because they, they're really just stubbing lambdas that call into your, say, your Node.js Node code, your index.js. So you can actually test your um, APIs offline uh, but, you know, before you land it, as the Instagram uh, guy was saying. And then you can actually go and put this into the serverless stack for mon monstrous scale effectively. Um, and the, the subtlety of this is that because you're, um, you, you could go and place a new idea of a product in nine, well, 11 of our regions globally, and your cost to be in 11 regions is close to zero. If no one in America is interested in your product, it's not costing you to have that application sitting there. If you have massive traction in Australia or South America, fantastic. Then you can go and focus on those regions and ramp it up, right? We've just announced another six regions globally, right? London, India, South Korea, a whole range of regions. So technically, with, with these serverless architectures, you, if you had 16 regions available to you, you would not be, uh, you wouldn't probably go, yeah, I'll, I'll put my EC2 stack in 16 regions and see where it's gonna take traction. It's, that's costly, right? With serverless design patterns, you're able to do uh, almost n new ways of experimenting. You're, it's almost, in a sense, putting compute closer to the edge, and then from there, of course, we've always CDN to the ultimate edge, right? But now you've got the ability to put compute to the edge in, uh, in as many regions as, as your cloud provider is offering you. So wh why use serverless, right? So, um, uh, you know, apart from the, the things I mentioned in the prior slide, I mean, one of, one of the challenges with any startup and a new product is keeping those costs low. And this is a real world example. The developers of the serverless framework, uh, one of them's in a company and they had a couple of EC2 servers. I think they were C3 larges. And they were sitting there highly available. You know, we, uh, you need to be in two zones to have sort of the appropriate uptime. Um, and they were receiving about 16,000 requests per day, running for about 200 milliseconds. Um, and um, it was a sign-up server or something. Um, and then they, they moved this to Lambda. Um, and of course, they're not requiring the, the high availability is implicit. And, uh, and, and this was their costing based on how Lambda is charged, right? It's, it's, it's six zeros, one six US cents, uh, you know, per, per millisecond. Uh, or per 100 milliseconds of execution. So, so it just shows you the kind of economics that are behind um, serverless compute and the efficiencies around that. So, um, so really, it's not about application isolation. It's actually endpoint as isolation. Um, every function has its own container. Um, and also, um, you know, it allows you to very quickly, it's kind of styled on like node NPM, like node manager, uh, package manager, you can just create a project, you can create a stage, you can deploy your code, you can promote through the stages. Um, and they've even incorporated the concept of um, packages that, so if someone's written a great serverless blog posting package, you can effectively include that in your serverless project and, and have all of the benefits of that deployed with your own custom projects. So uh, look, it's early, early days. You know, you can criticize a lot and so on about these frameworks, but uh, I think as a, as a paradigm, I think it's a very, very exciting place to be. Um, and just now I'm gonna be showing you like an Internet of Things type device, like a speaker connected to the internet. And um, I've written a custom Node.js, like Lambda function, and I'm gonna get Alexa to call it. So um, that's, how, that's how it's extensible. Um, and actually on the serverless website, they've got a really cool blog uh, or video that someone's done on their YouTube channel. Um, you know, th there's a lot of talks right now about React and, uh, you know, the Flux design pattern and like Relay um, and uh, GraphQL, right? This new, uh, I, I guess, the, the, the face thanks Facebook for that, uh, for the, the optimizing of how we build UI, you know, the collapsing of requests to the server. And GraphQL is, the, is this new kind of... Um, paradigm, and I'd really, you know, encourage you to look it out, but it's, it's kind of getting away from the problems that come with REST, right? It's almost a versionless uh, single endpoint. GraphQL is where you're querying on a single endpoint with a query language to get the results of what you want um, for your APIs. And, they've, and someone's written a, a great post about hosting GraphQL in Lambda and, and backing it with data stores from there. So, uh, so there's, there's a lot of cool stuff. 
So final pattern really is, um, you know, it, it, and let me just, just sum up where we've got to. So back the right innovation ecosystems, uh, learn and adapt, uh, you know, um, really, really what, what is, who in your, in your company is going to take on your machine learning strategy. Um, you know, scale when you need to and get your unit economics, especially when you're experimenting. I mean, these serverless design patterns, and I, I, I know many of you out here, and I know that if I give you a NoSQL and I give you uh, uh, the ability to run Node.js code, like, you know, the world's your oyster between all of these frameworks in, ter in terms of what could be done on a serverless design pattern. So, um, and then my final pattern that I see with very successful product companies is, um, is really just they scale to the opportunities that are out there, you know, ones that are not so obvious, you know, this, this black thing, uh, you know, and, uh, and take advantage of it. So, unfortunately, we don't, we're going to have sound on this video, but, um, but I think the principle, you'll get it. So, um, and, and again, with innovation, reinventing the wheel, right? I mean, I fly gliders and stuff, and, you know, it's not so easy, actually, to, to fly this, but... I think this is a great example. It's pretty, there's not sound, but um, you don't need it in this case. So nothing new here, right? Um, it's a, it's a, dr it's a, a, a little drone. Uh, it's got a camera, and it's using like wireless technology for control. It's self-driving, okay? That's, there's, there's the spin on it. But, um, but the point is, is like, you know, there's nothing new from the tech side, but they're just making, they're reinventing this wheel to be just more awesome. So it auto lands uh, when you gesture it. Um, uh, this is this is awesome as well. You'd want to remember to turn it on when you <laughs> when you do that. <laughs> Someone's going to do it. Uh, so yeah. Um, so just just really thinking about the customer. I mean, you know, imagine a, a normal you know drone that you're controlling and you're near a river. We all know what's going to happen, right? Um, so they made it waterproof because we all crash them in rivers, right? So uh, especially when you buy a river, you will crash it. And um, so it's just a great example of, of reinventing the wheel and, uh, and bringing awesome innovation and uh, simplicity to a product, uh, which is often the hardest thing to do. So Granny takes a screenshot of herself, so, I mean a, a photo, so I'll save you the pain. <laughs> um, good. Right. So, live demo time. Whew, stretch a bit, yeah? Okay, um, good. So, I thought like the best way to uh, maybe uh, show you the Alexa in action is, it's all great that it can, it can, um, it can give you, uh, it can play Spotify and it can give you the weather and, and all of these things, but, um, but I think what's awesome about it is its extensibility. And the extensibility um, platform is called Alexa Skills. And uh, you can program it to have a skill so it can re respond to a conversation. So what I've written here is, is uh, called a, a multi-intent invocation. Um, so it's, a, it's an invocation, uh, it's a beer, a beer ordering service that is multi it has a conversation with me, it's got multiple intents, and I program it, those intents, and take out various word parameters, and I go and take actions on it, right? So uh, it was just recently in the press, actually, I think Uber's integrated to it, so you can just say, hey, Alexa, order me an Uber. It also knows where you live, uh, scarily. So, um, so it'll bring an Uber to your home. Uh, it's, yeah, right now, unfortunately, I mean, it's an awesome device here in South Africa, but it's, uh, it's still tied to U.S. kind of zones, uh, uh, sorry, regions, so you can't break out of that, but, but, uh, but Spotify works amazingly and so on. Um, it also can control Bluetooth devices, so just uh, for you geeks out there. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so the world's your oyster to be able to say, you know, when is my next flight, or, uh, you know, whatever company you have, like, uh, click it all, like send an SMS. Uh, so um, anyway, I thought it'd be a, a, in the spirit of alcohol that uh, that uh, this conference has made famous. Um, I thought I'd do a beer ordering service. So uh, uh, Alexa, Alexa, ask beer buddy. Welcome to the League of Beers ordering service. You are logged in as Michael. Cancel. Goodbye. Thanks for using the League of Beers ordering service. I just want to say, I've used League of Beers. I've asked them that I could use their brand. Uh, so I uh, just want to qualify that. Alexa, ask Beer Buddy. 
Welcome to the League of Beers ordering service. You are logged in as Michael. So, I'm not going to say anything. Goodbye. Oh, Thanks sorry. for using the League of Beers ordering service. Sorry, because it heard me there. Uh, effectively, if I say nothing, it'll prompt me to say, mm, you can say this. So it has help like built in to urge you along in the conversation. And also, you can directly launch into an intent. So I can say, Alexa, ask Beer Buddy to place an order. Welcome to the League of Beers Sorry. ordering service. You are logged in as Michael. Place order. What beer would you like? Surprise me. There is a monthly mix of ales which includes Fuller's new Honeydew Organic Ales. Shall I order the usual six? <laughs> you are getting fat, by the way. Yes. Your order has been placed. Thank you for using the League of Beers ordering service. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll just show you the intent launch. So let me do that correctly. So uh, Alexa, Alexa, ask Beer Buddy to place an order. Sorry. Alexa, ask Beer Buddy to place an order. Sorry, I didn't understand. Okay. Let's start again. <laughs> she, she's off. She, Alexa. Goodbye. <laughs> Dude, n note the meme. What could go wrong, right? Okay, it's my last attempt, man. Alexa, ask Beer Buddy to place an order. What beer would you like? Cancel. Goodbye. Good. Thanks for using the League of Beers ordering service. So, so in the first example, I just said, ask Beer Buddy, right? And that's the invocation. And it said, right, like, uh, welcome to the service. In the second example, uh, which Alexa was resistant on, uh, I went straight into place an order and it just said, like, what beer would you like to order? So, um, yeah, so anyway, just awesome that that worked over this uh, network connectivity. So, um, so really, uh, I mean, this is a snippet of the code, uh, you know, in AWS, um, uh, you know, the philosophy is uh, have fun, which is why I wanted to do this talk and use the Alexa, uh, even though it was high risk. Uh, and also, you know, um, make history. I think that's probably the, I, I don't think League of Beers has ever had an Alexa ordered beer order uh, arrive on their door. So uh, hopefully we're making some history there. Uh, but this is, just, but it wasn't a lot of work. It wasn't work hard. Um, you know, th this is how you effectively prototype the functions for the various in in invocations. You can see here, uh, there's the surprise me intent, there's the, the intent for uh, uh, place order and so on. And then th this is running in a Lambda function. You've got up to one and a half gig of RAM. You've got temporary scratch storage at your own to you've got the full SDK of AWS available to you, you can call out to any, any web service um, from the fabric of AWS. So, so it, you know, I mean, if you go and write a custom skill, and there's millions, th this is one of the largest selling items in Black Friday uh, on Amazon for 100 plus dollars, uh, you're going to get a lot of traffic to that skill if it's popular. So um, the awesome thing is your ability to write these skills and scale out from there. So. And then my last example, I just want to end with this, is, um, you know, um, th this is a complex product. It's using voice uh, processing, et cetera. But how simple is this from an IoT perspective? And I think this is what, again, I'm encouraging you to, uh, to go out there and uh, really dominate uh, in terms of your IoT strategy. What's your machine learning strategy? What's your IoT strategy? With these, you basically press a button, and uh, your, your, uh, your, your product arrives, and you... Uh, Boom. Guys, League of Beers, very fast delivery in uh, the... <laughs> I you ordered this. I, I did. <laughs> I almost didn't. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Excellent. So, uh, there we go. Uh, League of Beers, honey, full as honey ale, amazingly. So, there we go. Seven years at UCT, taught me that. <laughs> Can you do my one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let's do it again. Yeah, fantastic. Whoa, live demo achieved. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, cheers. Uh, and um, yeah, so so that, that's really my last slide. Is is you know how awesome is this? How, I mean, have a button. You know, 
I don't know, you're in your Nordic loo in the forest and you're running out of loo paper, press the button and, you know, it's batch ordering every two days. It's going to bring you any button you've pressed, right? Uh, maybe you've got a boardroom at your, your cool office as you start up and it's getting close to four o'clock and you want beers. So press the beer button, you know? So, so there's, there's the opportunity. And, the, and people are paying you for the branding on the button. So, you know. So thank you. Uh, just a big... Uh, 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 just a bit of a shout out, um, there's a user community that's formed on Slack or on AWS. There's the URL to sign up um, and uh, please link up and just be aware we now have a relatively new a South African landing page for AWS. Um, and yeah, and also we are going to, um, uh, in, in thanks, League of Beers has sponsored a case of uh, of beers, and uh, so so put a tweet out, uh, put at League of Beers in there, put hashscale conf, and uh, after Q&A, Patrick will randomly uh, pick one of you, and uh, there's a case of beers uh, to take away. So thanks very much. Any questions? Oh, it's completely the opposite place where I'm standing. Um, so, uh, looking at that service, <laughs> I was looking at that serverless architecture, right? Um, I also have like sites where I don't even require load balancers or even servers. Um, tell me, how would I go about um, testing uh, with that serverless framework locally, though? Is that is that possible? So instead of writing the, the lambda functions in Amazon and testing them locally. Um, like, how would I have the Lambda yeah, functions? Yeah, so, so the serverless framework, like, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a complete expert in their framework, but my understanding is you're actually, it actually supports you uh, being able to call your functions um, sort of stubbed out off, outside of AWS. At the end yes. of the day, our API gateway, right, is just your REST definitions and mapping it internally to a Lambda. You can map it to an EC2 server or any HTTP endpoint, right, through API gateway. Our API gateway is, like, all about denial of service throttling, you know, perhaps billing and so on for your APIs. Um, but that's all it's doing. And what they're, what, what they're encouraging you is don't write like all your code inside the Lambda, but rather have the Lambda calling out then to, to the file or, or okay. what you've uploaded in the framework that contains your code. Because then you'd be able to call that uh, offline uh, outside of the cloud. And that has that, has that landed value. Uh, but of course, I mean, you know, Lambda's economics allow you to test it in the cloud in a dev environment you know, okay, across cool. nine regions without issue. So. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Jared. Uh, on the Internet of Things, do you support uh, the protocols like Z-Waves and other stuff, or you have your in-house built-in protocols? Uh, so protocol to, to where? To connect to the Internet of Things. Oh, yeah. We, we, we're, um, we support MQTT. Uh, which is sort of a, a more resilient, lighter weight protocol than HTTP, right? Um, and, um, you know, one of the challenges with IoT especially is that your, de your devices are going to be going in and out of, uh, yeah, they're, they're not always going to be there and connected. So the IoT service actually has this concept of a shadow device. So you're able to update state on your device in the cloud, and then when your device reconnects, it'll synchronize on its state. Um, so, but the protocol that it will be connecting to is MQTT, you can do WebSockets, that's quite recent, uh, you can do HTTP protocol, and we'll probably be releasing, you know, more and more protocols, uh, you know, over time. Uh, you know, what, one, one of the areas um, that we've, we've also got to work on is like, uh, you know, UDP and these kind, of, uh, these kind of challenges, but right now that's where the IoT uh, protocol is based. Sorry, that's where IT services is, is focused, yeah. And it's really about billions of devices being able to come in and, and, and absorb into the cloud on our scale. That's the value of doing it through a, through a cloud provider. 